This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. The entire nation is kind of holding its breath here in America due to a series of events that are going to happen relatively soon. One is the results of Bob Mueller's investigation into the Russian collusion, and then there are these the these rumors or reports on the internet that there's going to be a lot of arrests made in the relatively near future. Now, I'm not speaking of uh, necessarily one individual in particular, and and nor am I trying to uh, make a broad brush attack uh, against a whole lot of people. That's not my intention in either situation. But I do, before I want to begin, um, since I am a Bible teacher, I do want to discuss a principle in the Word of God uh, regarding people who function as prophets, who call themselves prophets, who have prophetic gifts. And you know, there's many people in our society that could be called secular prophets in that they do research and they don't uh, claim to be divinely inspired or anything, but they do research and then they predict what uh, they think is going to happen in the future. But the Bible gives very clear warnings uh, regarding the office of a prophet. And again, I'm not here to, you know, secretly uh, attack people. That's, that's not my purpose. But I see a whole lot of information on the internet from people who seem to have, quote, inside information. You know, really secretive, high-level information. And then I read about other people who have received uh, supernatural prophecies about what's going to happen in the future, or prophecies about what's going to happen in the future. Some of these people call themselves prophets. A lot of these people call themselves prophets. Uh, some say they have prophetic giftings, etc., etc. Now, the general biblical principle is this. We are to discern the spirits. So, no matter what kind of information we're getting from anyone, we're not supposed to simply accept that information as factual or accurate. In a number of these situations, uh, there are people who have come to the public light very, very recently, or relatively recently, in the last three years or so. And when you have people who emerge, and I, I consider, th you know, you, you haven't heard of somebody until three years ago, or you haven't heard in, in, uh, of somebody until relatively recently, <clears throat> that's kind of like coming out of the middle of nowhere. Because the person has not demonstrated a track record in ministry, a track record that proves integrity, a track record that uh, proves accuracy, a track record that uh, proves that uh, there are respected Christian leaders who re respect and are behind a particular individual. Therefore, to, to sum it all up, we should be approaching a lot of these uh, prophecies of the future, predictions of the future, claims to have inside intelligence information as what's going to happen into the future with a great deal of caution. And we should, when we hear and see these things or read these things, we should receive them with reticence. In other words, we just don't say, well, wow, that sounds incredible, you know, and, and just run off with it and, and b believe in it. Um, I've been walking with the Lord a long time, and I remember many presidents in office were people who called themselves prophets or had prophecies regarding various presidents. And I distinctly remember many, many, many of those prophecies about what God would do or wouldn't would do with this president or that president or what was going to happen in America, 
I distinctly recall going way back to my early years as a Christian. Uh, within certain circles, famous uh, men who call fam- famous uh, Christian men who who called themselves prophets, and they would issue these prophecies, and they would be written down. Now, again, I'm not here to to um, <clears throat> attack people, but I am here to say this that. A disturbingly high number of those prophecies did not come true. End of story. Uh, Somebody who was well known in the prophetic movement gave this stirring prophecy that during the presidency, that during while President Bill Clinton was going to be, while Bill Clinton was holding the office of president, that either in his first term or second term, he was going to experience a personal revival and that would open the floodgates for God to pour out an, a national revival on the United States of America. So the advice of this prophet was, don't criticize uh, Bill Clinton. You know, don't, don't really uh, exercise your uh, constitutional rights and stand up and, and uh, uh, speak out against him in the sense that if you don't believe in what he's saying, he was discouraging people from speaking out and participating in the political process because he kept making the claim that God was going to supernaturally save him and he was going to be an instrument of revival in the United States and around the world. Well, what happened was Bill Clinton never got saved. He was never used as an instrument of revival. And um, None of this happened, so it was all, all inaccurate. And inaccurate means it's a false prophecy. And I will repeat it again. It's a false prophecy. Now, when we analyze what the detrimental or negative effects were of this prophecy, I'm going to give you a summary of them. So many Christian leaders across the United States, primarily in the evangelical uh, camps and the charismatic camps or uh, Pentecostal Holy Spirit camps, huge numbers of people in those particular theological camps, and even those who weren't in those theological camps but would have been called evangelicals, uh, believed this prophecy. And they believed they were to do nothing to, to oppose uh, some of the uh, policies that that they should have been opposing, uh, but th- but they were completely passive because they were convinced that this prophet's prophecy was going to come true, and Bill Clinton was going to have a dramatic born again experience while in office, and that would be the beginning of an outpouring of revival in Bill Clinton's life and the nation. So. If you look at this um, false prophecy just through the eyes of political strategy, let's just lay aside for a minute the spiritual dimensions. If you look at this prophecy just through the eyes of political strategy, or let's call uh, call it uh, political strategy and psychological operations or psychological warfare, this man who was a very well-known prophet in many circles, delivered a fa- false prophet, which was believed by so many pastors in the United States who should have known better, because they weren't praying themselves. They were looking to a man to be their interpreter of the Lord's voice. This man's false prophecy caused a huge percentage of the evangelical or the born-again church to go to sleep to be passive, to not occupy our na- the nation until Jesus comes, to stop uh, speaking out and getting involved uh, politically. So basically, he enabled the kill switch to be pressed, to shut down all the things that pastors and churches and Christians should have been doing 
in terms of being aware, alert, and opposing very dangerous programs that would threaten the church. Because they all listened to this false prophecy, they were all lulled into a false sense of security, and they were lulled to sleep or slumber. Because the prophecy was false. It never happened. It was not true. And I know many well-respected ministers who bought on to this thing. And uh, I don't claim to be better than anybody else. I'm simply saying, when I heard the prophecy, you know, God says discern the spirits. We have the Holy Spirit that lives inside us, the spirit of truth. We also have the Word of God. But I remember hearing this prophecy, and I had a check in my spirit, like it wasn't right. Like the alarm bells were going off in my inner man. Well, that's that's discernment operating in you. If you hear something that people are saying is from the Lord, but it doesn't bear witness to you that it's from the Lord, assuming you're walking with the Lord, and assuming you're mature in your relationship with the Lord, that's a lot of assumptions. So, my biggest concern was that it was a false prophecy. It turned out to be a false prophecy. It set the church back. It set the, uh, what God's people were supposed to be doing. It, it put them back to sleep. And it created great harm against the work of Jesus Christ and the spreading of the gospel in our nation. Because all these Christian pastors and born-again pastors of various theological camps should not have just accepted this man's prophecy, which they did, without seeking the Lord themselves. And it turned out to be a false prophecy. Now, later on, a number of years later, this same prophet, then it's discovered that he was uh, discovered in a series of uh, moral scandals involving women. Now, the two don't always go together, but sometimes they go together. And in this case, they did go together. And if you ask me what was the root problem here, I'll tell you what the root problem was, because I know many uh, well-known Christian leaders who followed this prophet and heard things they, they told me. They stopped looking to Jesus. They stopped seeking Jesus. And they became enamored and fixated with the gifts that this man apparently was able to exercise. And they would tell me all these supernatural stories about this prophet that that I thought sounded outrageous. I actually was very skeptical, and I really didn't believe them. It's not that I don't believe in miracles. I do believe in miracles. It's not that I don't give, believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I do believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But years ago, Pat Robertson said something, and he was... Uh, rebuking and exhorting two, at that time, this is a long time ago, two a very well-known like uh, faith teacher, uh, a husband and wife team, uh, who were very popular in certain circles. And <clears throat> he, he chastised them on his television program because they claimed to have this vision that angels had come down outside of their house uh, during the winter and, and were having, the angels were having snowball fights with each other uh, around their house in the winter. Now, the, the well-known television evangelist was Pat Robertson, and Pat Robertson said, that's not how God operates. God doesn't send angels down to earth to, to play trivial games like have snowball fights for the amusement of his people. And I I agreed with him completely. When something becomes like stupid and it becomes insipid and ridiculous, chances are it's not God. So I heard all these stories about how this guy, and this was the expression, he could read your mail, which means he could like telepathically know everything you were thinking, what was going on in your life, and that he would land in cities and be picked up by... Uh, people who were going to uh, have him speak at a conference, and he could just like like supernaturally know how to get there. He never n- needed to use a map because he'd look at her license plate, and the Holy Spirit would tell him intricately how to drive to where they were going. And that too sounded ridiculous. So when all these things finally added up, and he made this prophecy, which 
I didn't, my spirit didn't wear witness to. He ended up paralyzing the body of Christ. And this has happened not once. This has happened repeatedly. Repeatedly because uh, there are significant numbers of Christians, both individually and in leadership, who are not operating and conducting their lives in agreement with God's word, which has all kinds of warnings and guidelines regarding all kinds of topics, especially prophecy, false prophecy, false prophets, false teachers, uh, the discerning of spirits, the need to seek the Lord and not to to seek man. And so, um, right now, we're in another season uh, where um, we're, we're getting these secular prophets and these Christian prophets, and I'm going to be very honest, they are highly questionable to me. Highly questionable. And when you say, well, why? Because I'm using the brain that God gave me. I'm praying. I, I'm learning from life experience, and I'm seeing the same patterns repeat that I saw in these earlier false prophecies and stuff. And, you know, one individual is claiming to have this inside connection to Trump and and is making all these statements about what's going to happen. You know what? A lot of people you know, including yourself, you need to be careful before you swallow everything that is being uh, offered to you, hook, line, and sinker. You may be in for a rude surprise. Christians are generally too gullible. They don't use discernment. They don't use practical wisdom. Okay? In one particular case, this man's ministry arose out of uh, basically nowhere in the last number of years. He hasn't been around all that much time. That's, that is a biblical warning sign, by the way. Because the biblical model is a Christian leader is raised up over time, and he has mature, sober uh, leaders of excellence to vouch for his ministry. He just doesn't pop up out of the middle of nowhere performing uh, miracles, and then, you know, the next thing you know, God's giving him this uh, detailed supernatural information. And then you have this uh, guy, I guess he's secular, I don't know what he is. But it doesn't ring true. And a lot of people you know are, are being set up just like this other prophet many years ago. You're, 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 you're abandoning your responsibilities of what you should be doing. You're um, not uh, perceiving things the way you should via biblical perspective. And you're making, you're making this leap of logic that a lot of these too-good-to-be-true promises are going to happen. And that's what you're basing your life on. Now, I'm not here to give a final conclusion as if they're going to happen or if they're not going to happen. But the one thing I do know is that you need to look at it objectively, critically, and not just accept it. Or if you're going to accept it, accept it with uh, scrutinization. But we have an entire nation of Christians um, basically getting their marching orders and their actions and their behavior based on some really, to be blunt, wacky sources. Okay, I said it, wacky sources. Now that's all I'll say about this. Because, you know, when God raises up men or women, when God speaks, there's always... When you know God, not just know about God, when you know God, you recognize his handiwork. And when stuff is just too sugar sweet and just too good to be true, and, and you know, watch it. 
You need to watch it because there's a lot of people running around who are claiming to be prophets. And I am, I am going to say this. Um, many of them are not prophets. They may be Christian leaders. They may, be, they may have valid ministries, but they're not prophets. Now, unlike others, um, I, I'm not going to make a blanket statement. Notice that I didn't say that everybody who claims to be a prophet is not a prophet. I didn't say that. I believe God has raised up people with prophetic voices, prophetic ministries in our time. And uh, God is speaking through those people in a prophetic manner. Now, in regards to people who choose to call themselves prophets, um, who, whose ministries continually bear fruit over time and line up with the Bible, um, I'm not going to say they're not prophets. I'm not going to make a blank, blanket statement and say that every single person who says they're a prophet is not a prophet. Assuming the, the caliber of their leadership is in place, etc., and, and assuming they're not saying anything that disagrees with the Word of God. But I am saying that of the percentage of people who call themselves prophets, probably a much smaller percentage would actually qualify to be prophets, and a lot of them are not at all. Now, of the ones that qualify to be prophets, um, if that person's ministry is strong and it's stood the, uh, uh, the test of time, etc., then I'm not going to uh, judge a man over what may simply be a disagreement in um, what title, uh, what offices are available in the New Testament versus the Old Testament. Because that, in many cases, can be a theological disagreement. For example, there are a lot of people in the body of Christ who believe, who are very strong men of God, and they believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, went away with the disciples, and that there are no gifts of the Holy Spirit for today. And many of these are very solid Christian leaders. I don't agree with that. I believe that uh, within certain constraints, many of the gifts of the Holy Spirit are still operational today. So that, that's a disagreement. Now, people can escalate that to, you know, we'll break fellowship over that. I don't think that's worth breaking fellowship over. There's doctrine that's worth breaking fellowship over if somebody's preaching false doctrine. So when it comes to somebody calling themselves a prophet, um, I, I have a prophetic ministry. I minister prophetically. However, I do not call myself a prophet. I don't wear that label. I prefer saying that I uh, am a Bible teacher of Bible prophecy. I preach and teach in, in the prophetic arena. Um, but I don't call myself, quote, a prophet because when I read the scripture, in order to be a true biblical prophet, um, your accuracy has to be 100%, like all the Old Testament prophets like um, Ezekiel, Joel, Isaiah, Daniel, etc. They all had to be 100% accurate. And if anybody in the Old Testament was not 100% accurate, they were stoned to death as a false prophet. Now, uh, with all due respect to some of my brothers who have a slightly different viewpoint here, I've never met anybody who is 100% accurate uh, with all their prophecies and prophetic statements. And because of that, I uh, don't call myself a prophet, and I have a problem with that. 
Now, other people may have an interpretation, which I suppose they allow themselves to be called prophets. Again, I'm not making a blanket statement uh, saying that everybody who calls himself a prophet is a false prophet. <clears throat> but I am saying there is a considerable percentage of people who call themselves prophets who are not prophets. Now, as for those that are strong Christian leaders, etc., that call themselves prophets, uh, as long as they're not teaching and preaching things that are in contradiction to the Word of God, um, that's between them and God. You know, the Christian culture has different interpretations, and it has to get along as long as those interpretations aren't violent violations of the Word of God. So, for example, you have people of the Calvinist uh, theological persuasion, you have fundamentalists, you have Baptists, you have average evangelicals, you have charismatics, you have Pentecostals, you have all kinds of tribes, if you will, in the Christian community. And they have, most of these people agree on the, the basic tenets of the faith, but there are areas where there's strong disagreement. I don't think it's wise to break fellowship over strong disagreement unless that strong disagreement is so egregious and what is at issue is the basic doctrines of the faith. And if somebody's running off teaching heresy or apostasy or false prophecy, etc., then, uh, you know, you, you can't really be in fellowship with them. And then what adds and contributes to this confusion is you have a lot of people who are very zealous and they read books and stuff, um, which is to their credit, and many times they make some very, uh, they, they uh, view, view it as their ministry to uh, hold all the other ministries accountable. And many times they will point out uh, biblical inconsistencies between ministers and ministries and uh, publish articles, etc., uh, challenging them. And that, that there's a need for that ministry, type of ministry. Let's call it a spiritual counterfeits ministry. Tal Brook, who was a friend of mine, ran one of the original spiritual counterfeit ministries. Dave Hunt, who was a friend of mine, on my radio show, hour after hour, was very big into exposing spiritual counterfeits and New Age doctrine. And uh, Roger Oakland, the head of uh, Lighthouse Trails Ministry, also has a spiritual counterfeits ministry. But the problem is that there are many other ministries in that vein, and even though in some places they may be accurate, even though in many places they may be accurate regarding their critiques and criticism, you know, if you're going to have a ministry like that, you have got to have matured in the Lord so that your character, your actual character as a man and woman of God, your maturity in your walk with Jesus has to match or exceed your knowledge of spiritual counterfeits and false, false doctrine or error. Because if your character as a man or woman of God uh, and as a Christian leader has not grown, it's like a, giving a kid, you know, the father's car before the kid's ready to drive the car. And you have a lot of that in the spiritual counterfeits ministry. You have people who... Uh, for whatever reason, uh, the Lord has not developed their character, the fruits of the Spirit, their leadership, and so they violate all kinds of very important biblical rules, even though they, they may be right in some cases, or right in many cases, regarding heresy or false doctrine or apostasy. They may have many of those facts correct, but if you're embellishing 
what you're writing, which is called lying, uh, because you're so quick to draw the trigger against somebody. You didn't bother to get your facts straight, which is rampant among people in that kind of ministry, and that reflects a lack of a growth of character. And if you um, lie or exaggerate and then don't speak the truth in love, if you're if, if you're speaking and your your goal is not to redeem or build the kingdom of God, even if you are being strong in a rebuttal, you can be strong and be in a rebuttal against somebody, but you do it in love. You speak the truth in love. Francis Schaeffer, who was a giant, a theological giant, whose whole basic ministry was hold, holding the entire evangelical church accountable for going astray into humanistic doctrines, New Age doctrines, etc. God was able to use Dr. Francis Schaeffer in a way that most of these spiritual accountable ministries will never grow to that size. Because Dr. Francis Schaeffer, the Lord developed his character as a person, as a leader, as a father. And so even though he took on the entire evangelical truth, he spoke the truth in love, he didn't lie, he knew his subjects, etc., etc. And he walked as a man of God, whereas a lot of these people, they, they, they take a delight in, in trying to see somebody destroyed, and they lie. And they misrepresent. And they, their motives in their heart are not right. See, Francis Schaeffer, his heart was concerned with Christ and the body of Christ. And when he spoke the truth, which was very tough sometimes, he spoke the truth in love. These people are very harsh and strident. Many times they don't have their facts right. And yet the irony is, many of them potentially could have excellent ministries and really be used mightily by God because there's such a need to expose heresy and false doctrine. There's such an enormous need to do that now. But even though you may be brilliant, if you're falling in love with your brilliance, you're going to miss uh, the target that God has for you. Because your, your analysis may be right on. You may totally have uh, analyzed the root of the falsehood, the spiritual era, where they went astray, what uh, influences caused them to be astray. And you warn the church, and that's all well and good. But if you haven't developed your character, and you're mixing some self-deceit and lying in there, and you're kind of delighting in what you're doing, like a kid drunk with power, and uh, you're not speaking the truth in love, then you're creating a lot of problems. And so what, what happens is, when you have that dynamic encountering the dynamic of the reality of, yes, we have an evangelical church in America, which is uh, just like following every false teacher or false doctrine. I mean, it's rampant. It's an epidemic. So the people who are the uh, challenging people in heresy are often right. It's just they're doing more harm than good because they're not, they haven't allowed God to develop their character. So, back to this thing, though. Whether it's somebody claiming to be a Christian and speaking from God, or somebody claiming to have inside information, I want to address some basic principles, okay? Basic principles that you have to apply before you should listen. And you're, you're supposed to be evaluating and discerning the spirits. And you're supposed to be judging the prophets, and then you're supposed to recognize that a lot of people who call themselves prophets aren't prophets to begin with. You're not just supposed to be, you know, allowing everything into your life and believing everything. Because then you're going to end up participating in destruction. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. This is Paul McGuire. Knowledge is power, and Jesus Christ said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. 
I believe with everything in me that it is absolutely imperative that it is 100% necessary for any individual who wants to be everything God created them to be. <clears throat> the only way you're going to get there is knowledge, which requires education, and that's not just going to some secular university and being programmed into some kind of Marxist robot. And nor am I discouraging the necessity of getting higher education, because there's many fields you can't go anywhere without higher education. <clears throat> but either ch- uh, path you choose, <clears throat> you have to self-educate. You have to read books. And I'm not talking about dumb books on dumb subjects that program you. I'm talking about books that expand your mind, teach you history, make you uh, wise. Now, of course, the first book and the most important book that anyone should read is the Bible. And the Bible should be read daily. And you should read the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation during the course of a year, and read the Bible, hear the Bible as much as you can, because the Bible is the greatest source of wisdom uh, regarding practical life, regarding marriage, family, society, regarding spiritual discernment, regarding salvation, the great war between Christ and Lucifer, the days Uh, the last days, and so on and so forth. The Bible is the most important book ever written. And you need a translation that is accurately um, transcribed. And people differ, but I would say go with the King James Version. But if you're a new believer and you you can't make it over the these and thous of uh, Shakespearean English, then go with the New King James Version. Because the, that, and there's maybe one or two other versions that are accurate, but forget about the rest of them, because they're so distorted, they will not tell you what the Bible's actually saying. Now, having said that, a lot of Christians make the, the completely non-biblical mistake of saying, well, all I need to do is read the Bible. That is one dumb statement. Sounds spiritual. Hear it all the time. The problem with saying, All I need to do is read the Bible, Brother Paul. All I need to do is read the Bible, the Word of God. Well, the problem with that is this. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell you to do that. So you're off running amok on the plantation where the Bible says you're to cry out to God for wisdom and read his word. Absolutely. But the the Bible also says just one little hint in the book of Proverbs. It says, that, you, that wisdom cries out in the streets. Wisdom cries out in the marketplace. Wisdom cries out from nature. See, God reveals himself. God reveals truths. When you're walking with him, seeking his face, renewing your mind with the word of God, God will speak to you and educate you through the people, the events, and circumstances all around you. And you must have that kind of wisdom also to live. Not just sitting like, you know, in a lotus position in your house and just reading the scripture. And anybody who tells you that is uneducated, especially regarding the word of God, because it's the opposite of what God's word teaches. Now, God's word does teach us that the word of God is our final authority in all things. So if we're reading some secular book that may have a lot of wisdom in it, but then we read, like I read science books and psychology books and books on neuropsychiatry all the time, uh, and uh, they'll say, well, we know this because man evolved over, you know, 100 million years. Well, then I got to question their theory. I got to question their outcome because mankind never evolved. Facing your science on a flawed theory, then I can't trust your your outcome. So that's where we place the Bible above any other authority, because God's word is not equal to humanistic psychology. It's the final word of God. Okay, so the thing that we have to understand is that um, it's important to gain wisdom 
And when we gain wisdom, the Bible says over and over again, it talks about the discerning of spirits, which implies that not every man or woman who speaks, who communicates, who writes, who lectures, who's in ministry, who's a politician, or whatever, is motivated by the Spirit of God. There are people, and and this may be a cold bucket of ice water in, in somebody's drunk face that you know, But there are people who I believe, and the Bible certainly says that, who are raised up by the powers of darkness, and they speak motivated by a demonic spirit. You've seen it. People whose countenance and the words they say and what they advocate is just pure evil. I was uh, talking to you a week or two ago about Dr. Jose... uh, Delgado and the things he said about mind control that were horrifying monstrous now I don't know him I'm not going to say the man was demon possessed but I will say this that was some pretty hardcore evil that was coming out of his mouth so it makes you wonder that's all just makes you wonder the other thing is that it's very important to understand that we're bombarded with voices, cultural leaders, mainstream media, alternative media, this Bible teacher, this pastor, um, people who have internet, social media platforms. You have to be discerning. I was reading yesterday a book uh, on history of the uh, about the city of London, which is the real... There's two cities of London. There's the exterior city of London that all the tourists see. And then inside the city of London, there's what's called the city or the city of London, which is where the Rothschild family and the internationals are located, which basically control the world. And uh, this book dealt with that, but the book also talked about the fact how people like Rothschild and the Illuminati and others in this globalist elite are passionate readers and followers of uh, Machiavelli uh, who wrote books like The Prince and he spent his lifetime studying um, how generals conquer, how leaders take control over nations. And so he compiled all of their techniques and, and he put it together in a kind of a how-to manual for any aspiring dictator or totalitarian to use to ruthlessly control the nation. And every sentence that that I've read in Machiavelli's books is just dripping with pure evil. I'm paraphrasing, but he says things like, it's fine to make friends, but don't, don't hesitate a second to totally betray your friends. It's pure evil, the book. Yeah, you make alliances. Say whatever you need to say to make the people believe you. And then it advocates the killing and slaughter of everybody except for you and your agenda. It's pure evil. And so many people, businessmen and political leaders, read this book and follow it. Now, one of Machiavelli's principles was that uh, he said to raise uh, that, that a lot of great leaders in history raised up what is now called controlled opposition which is a dictator or a leader or a president or a prime minister uh, secretly finances, organizes, and raises up uh, groups that appear to be out to oppose him, appear to be out to get him out of office. But secretly, the leader is financing them in the function of controlled opposition. And the reason for that is is it burns people out, it confuses them, because the purpose of leaders in a false opposition movement is to confuse and uh, demoralize people who are uh, in conflict with the dictatorship or totalitarian regime. Now, there are a lot of people in the media who pretend to be conservatives on national mainstream media, but they're not conservatives. They're controlled opposition. I'll give you a huge example of that. 
and, and people need to speed and not be so naive. William Buckley, the darling of darling conservatives, the intellectual conservative. Many of you may not know who he is, but a couple of decades ago, before he uh, passed on, uh, Buckley had one of the most powerful and probably the only uh, supposedly strongly conservative television talk show. And it had a massive audience because back then there was only three networks. And Buckley would basically, basically control the conservative movement in America because of his platform. Well, it turns out uh, that Buckley was not just a brilliant man. He, he was an excellent speaker, excellent debater. But he really wasn't just a homegrown conservative. He was an employee of the, the CIA, Central Intelligence Agency. He was a CIA operative. And his function was to control the opposition to the Rockefeller globalists and the Rockefeller uh, uh, takeover of the U.S. government. So he was the voice of conservatism because Rockefeller was not a conservative and neither are the globalists. But what he was really doing is he was, he was leading the conservative movement in exactly the direction that Rockefeller wanted. And that was his function as an employee of the CIA. And um, I was quite shocked and stunned to read this. But there's a lot more to it. You know, controlled opposition didn't go away with Buckley or Machiavelli. The magazine, which you may know, it's still around, that Buckley established and wrote for, and it's still in business. And it's very interesting, because I observed this 10 years ago when I was uh, a frequent guest on Fox News Network and CNN and many of the other channels when I was playing the conservative talk show host game. But I noticed that people from certain publications and things, they, they, seem, to, they seem to be not on the side of true conservatism. They just acted that way. And you will notice that this magazine, National Review, which Buckley uh, started, it continues to be in business. And it's interesting that many of their writers have been very anti-Trump. And the question remains, is it still in Oregon of the CIA? Are the writers writing for the CIA? Because there's many conservative publications and liberal pu publications that are controlled by the CIA and other intelligence agencies for the purpose of leading the opposition. And uh, the same goes for politicians and everything else. I could give you, I'm, I don't really want to get into a whole lot of names, but there is a very, very well-known, um, he, he, he sold himself as a conservative radio talk show host, and then he became a big conservative television host. And then he had kind of a meltdown of some kind. And then he re so So he goes from lecturing. Well, what I really think happened is that he uh, stole his ideas from Alex Jones because the way he would do his presentation and his charts and his pictures were right off of Alex Jones. And so he was on another network. And then, mysteriously, his personality changes or whatever. He disappears, and, and now he's, he attacks Trump viciously, and he's out in the twilight zone somewhere. Now, my personal opinion is he was used, either intentionally or unintentionally, as controlled opposition. But it really, my, my personal opinion, which I'm to... Uh, echo in public regarding him goes far deeper than that. So the point I'm trying to make with, with the reality of controlled opposition so everywhere with, with the mainstream media dominating and controlling 
a narrative. And then you have strange characters in the spiritual community, the Christian community, and strange characters in alternative media. You can't just take everybody at Facebook. You have to use discernment. And that comes by educating yourself and reading. It comes from prayer and seeking the Lord. It comes from renewing your mind with the Word of God and making comparisons and thinking for yourself and not not being gullible and just assuming that just because somebody acts like they're one way, that that's who they really are. Self-education is, not, is, 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 is critical. The amount of Christians I meet who don't read, period, is disgusting. Now, I understand you're busy. Okay, me too, very busy. But you could listen to audio books. There's, there's other ways you can read without having to sit somewhere with a book in front of you. Because if you're not reading, you're not being educated. And if you, you, if you think, if you are so naive as to think that you're getting educated by watching mainstream media, including the pseudo-conservative television network, you are kidding yourself. You're getting such a, a, a starvation diet of knowledge that, that it's amazing you can even think at all. And, and God puts that ball in your court. That's why I tell people to read. I read constantly, and I'm busier than most people I know. And I don't have time to sit somewhere, by the way. So I'm, I grab a book. When I'm on a treadmill, I'm not spacing out watching TV or rocking out. And it's a little bit dangerous, so if you're going to do this, you got to <clears throat> make sure you don't injure yourself. <clears throat> but I p- p- place a book up before me on the treadmill in a way that's safe so I don't fall off the treadmill and kill myself and I'll, I'm, I've taught myself to be a speed reader I read really fast and then I zero in on the information that I'm looking for and you know my wife said Paul don't tell people how many books you read a month when you were a kid because they'll never believe you and they just think you're lying so I decided because the amount of books I read a month that I was telling people for years was an accu- it was an accurate number. That's how many books I read a month, which was a huge amount of books per month. And this this goes from grammar school to high school every month. But it continued on through a variety of jobs and stuff. And it continues on to this day. I still read an enormous amount. Because it's the only way I can keep myself educated and knowledge is power. So I read on the treadmill and every place that I can. Now, um, I'm also the author of 31 books. And so what I do is I exhaustively read through thousands of books, getting information, spending years, okay? And then, so when I write a book, I'm, I'm able to pull from all that knowledge And let me recommend some books to you that will get you up to speed, they're accurate, and they they emphasize and focus in on the really important issues, not peripheral issues. So let's start with uh, my book, uh, Conquering the Matrix, which deals with scientific mind control, how to know if you're under the influence of scientific mind control or hypnotic state or whatever how to understand mass mind control, and how to set yourself free. And and importantly, a lot of people you love and know, your kids, your husband, your wife, they are under subtle degrees of mass mind control. And and if you doubt that, that's fine. That's why you got to get educated, because I prove to you in my books, like Conquering the Matrix, uh, Mass Awakening, A Prophecy of the Future of America, I prove to you that mass mind control is an ongoing experience in America and around the world from very powerful, credible sources. In other words, the people who actually set up the system. Otherwise, if you're unsure and you bring it up to somebody, you know, 
there are a lot of Americans under scientific mind control that are going to think you're crazy, but if you can prove it, and my books are fast reading books, they're not boring textbooks. So those three would really help people you know. And during Christmas time or and you know, people spend money on gifts. Why not give a gift that gives people truth, that sets people free, that can bring them to Christ instead of getting giving them expensive clothing or something? I give books. Have I gave books for years? I'm not just not just talking about my own books. I would buy other people's books to give out for years. So those are three good ones. And then uh, tracing all of this back to ancient Babylon, the Babylon Code that I wrote with my co-author Troy Anderson. As a you you know what? Just read the reviews on the Babylon Code. And the other book I wrote with Troy Anderson, a Pulitzer Prize-nominated journalist called Trumpocalypse. The, the, just read the reviews. And the, 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 they're all, like, close to five-star. The only reason that they're not... When I say close to five-star, they're, like, four and three-quarters star, stars. And you know, the only reason we have any negative at all, because it's, well, everything, every review is phenomenal, is because there's enemies out there. Enemies who are trying to take you down. So they, they deliberately uh, will write a negative review to impact you. But it doesn't work because they're so, they're, the percentage of negatives is like ridiculously small. But that's what they do. There's people who do that. Not just to me. They do it to other conservatives and Christians. So uh, <clears throat> the other thing is that Trumpocalypse, we are going into a season where there's a lot of people making these really outrageous claims about what's going to happen. And most of those claims are not going to happen. You need to know what's going to happen based on two people, me and Troy Anderson, did an enormous amount of research, interviewed people at the highest levels of government, interviewed people on the left, leading Christian leaders, personal interview with Billy Graham, and, and read Trumpocalypse and know what's happening, know why they're going after Trump, know what their next thing is. Instead of reading some guy who just came out of nowhere uh, and, and speaks in this cryptic, code-like language, I mean, give me a break, okay? Really, where's the track record? Well, he said this, he said supposedly this. How do you know? My life is an open book. Troy's life is an open book. I've been, I've, I've been doing what I've been doing for 40 years. I didn't just, you know, materialize in the middle of the desert six months ago in, in a mystical cloud. People that, uh, people that you can trust have a track record that can be verified. Now, that track record may show you that they can't be trusted, that they're a member of some secret society or something. But Trump, Trump, Trumpocalypse grips people, and they can't put it down. Same with the Babylon Code and uh, a prophecy of the future of America, conquering the Matrix, and mass awakening. They're, they're powerful books. I mean, they really are, but they're, they're fun to read. I, I wrote it that way. Now, you can get those books at super discounts right now at paulmcguire.us. Also, we have a like a, a documentary video that we're releasing called American Mind Control, the coming uh, crisis event. And it's, you'll be able to, to download it at paulmcguire.us. Um, that would make a powerful gift. It'll be out any day now. Any day it'll be out. And uh, it basically talks about the fact that the media is under total control of the globalist elite and what techniques they're using to keep people brainwashed. What their goal is and what their end game is, see? And their end game is a one-world socialist government. Now, you'll never... This is why you need to self-educate yourself and take advantage of 
authors that you trust, speaking of trust, who <clears throat> give you information that the mainstream media pretends doesn't exist. And I'm not just talking about myself. There, there are a number of people that you know and I know that are, I consider them very good authors and researchers. <clears throat> the kind of information they have to give you, you'll never get it in the mainstream media. And it's vital for you to know. So, um, the, the whole, see, what the mainstream media is hiding from you is the most important facts that would enable you to understand what's really going on. So, let's talk about fact number one. All of this chaos in the U.S., at the border, et cetera, et cetera, in Europe with the G20 summit, uh, which I believe was not in Europe, I think it was in Buenos Aires. So. All of this stuff is manufactured crisis or chaos in order to put together the new world order and to put together a one world socialist government. That's what we're on the fast track to. And all of my books explain that and emphasize different parts of it. Everything from the brainwashing of youth, the world system, through mass the mainstream media, through music, through TV, films. Notice the continual bombardment to many generations of youth, not only the dumbing down on purpose that occurs in the school system, where they're being programmed to be happy, compliant citizens of the new world order, but notice that the rock and roll, the hip-hop, the, the uh, uh, other forms of music, Rap, the, the prolifer proliferation of Illuminati symbols, satanic symbols, occultic symbols, all kinds of Lucifer and stuff, the lyrics that have Illuminati satanic lyrics in them. Why? Because their repetition is a powerful form of brainwashing. They're trying to brainwash your... Listen, let me spell it out to you very, very clearly. The school system... The media, they're deliberately trying to brainwash your children and many generations of young adults into, here's their plan, and I write about it in great length, so, so you don't have to believe what I'm saying now. You can get the documentation from my books. In the 1920s, the Frankfurt School set up in Frankfurt, Germany. Now, I talk about this in Conquering the Matrix. We talk about this in our book, um, Trumpocalypse. The, the purpose of the Frankfurt School was to, uh, it was a bunch of uh, university professors that formerly were headquartered in communist Moscow, Russia. They were trained by the KGB, so they set up shop in Frankfurt, Germany. And their game plan, our goal, is to initiate communist revolutions in America and the Eastern European nations and Australia and uh, New Zealand and many other nations, but not the, 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 the original communist-type revolutions, you know, that were bloodbaths and guns and shooting. The Frankfurt School mapped out a plan that would change the cultures of these Western-style nations like the U.S., and through things like political correctness and political correct wording and stuff, that's how they would initiate their communist Marxist revolution. So, um, I research, I, I just don't go one level. I go like 40 levels deep, and it takes decades. And I'm always getting new information, which I put in the books. So in American Mind Control, the, the documentary download that will be available for you in the next couple of days, I, I go into this information. I also have it in Mass Awakening and A Prophecy of the Future of America. The, and in uh, Trumpocalypse. The Frankfurt School Marxists, no, their number one agenda was, number one, destroy Christianity from America. Number two, destroy the Christian family. Number three, destroy the Christian concept of right and wrong. 
and then destroy uh, patriotism, nationalism, and a belief in the sovereignty of independent nations. Those were their bullseye targets starting in the 1920s. So they, they, so they saturated the universities and colleges with the Frankfurt School Marxist professors. That's why we have these tenured Marxist professors everywhere. They use the media, they use film, they use music, they use the educational system, and they bring and indoctrinated many generations of young people, many who are now adults, into believing that it's better to have a global society, a one-world society, like John Lennon sang about. They succeeded during the 70s with LSD and Aldous Huxley in... Uh, um, destroying Christian marriage and creating what they called a tribal, uh, like a tribal society that was anti-technology. That was the purpose of the hippie movement because they wanted to reduce the power and influence in America. And then they got rid of the concept of right or wrong they destroyed Christianity as a religion, and they replaced it with the New Age, the occult, and Satanism, LSD, sexual orgies, all the sexual perversion everywhere. That's part of the plan. It's, it's to break down the, what's left of, of a Christian America. It's to break it down. It's to disintegrate it. Why? Because... These people are intellectuals, they're geniuses. They understand that by doing this, utilizing scientific mind control, washing, indoctrination, advertising, persuasion, social engineering, all of which I explain in easy to read uh, fashion in the books I mentioned, they have dismantled America as we know it. They want people dumbed down. They lowered the, the, the monetary uh, uh, value of the middle class and the working class. Rockefeller financed a lot of this because they want to destroy America. Why? Because America is super important in the history of mankind. And this is where a lot of Christians are confused. So if you're, you're too listening to Christians who are confused, you're, you're not going to understand the program. The Marxists, the communists, the Satanists, the, the globalists understand just how important America is. And they're doing the, everything they can to destroy it so they can bring in their one world order, one world economic system, one world religion, and one world government. This is what I explain in these books. And, and prayerfully, you should give gifts that communicate truth. Because we're in the, a battle for the hearts and minds of mankind. So, here's, here's the, the, the key thing. And we go into a great deal about this in the book, Trumpocalypse. They have targeted Donald Trump for destruction. Because he is the single most greatest threat to this globalist Marxist government that is totally controlled for the benefit <clears throat> of the globalist elite. They've targeted him. They own the mainstream media. They own a lot of the institutions that are supposedly being run by we the people. And they're tearing apart our Constitution and Bill of Rights even as we speak. And you need to know about it. You need to read. You need to be educated. Now, God's people and many Americans are reading. They are becoming educated. That's what I talk about in my book, Mass Awakening. There can be a good and godly mass awakening. But if people are not really educating themselves and somebody comes on the internet who you never heard of four or five years ago, and they're telling you they got all these messages from God about what's going to happen, or these codes, because, quote, they have the inside track. And they're basically telling you, relax, <clears throat> you know, there's going to be, the evil people are going to be arrested, mass arrests of 60,000 people and more. Um, you need to take a deep breath, 
a cold shower and have a cup of coffee and ask yourself the question, are these voices seducing you to fall asleep, just like that false prophet I was talking about that seduced the entire evangelical movement into falling asleep during the presidency of uh, Bill Clinton? Now, I'm not saying that, that I'm not making a definitive statement as to whether or not what these guys are projecting are, are, are going to, what, if it's going to come true or not. Neither of us have enough information, and they don't have a track record that's solid enough to predict. But I am very suspicious, having been around the block, having plain old street sense. You know, I remember when I was a kid, <clears throat> I don't know why my parents who were atheists would have me do this stuff, but they did. Well, Paul, put your tooth that fell out of your mouth under the pillow, and in the morning, the tooth fairy will do something. <laughs> well, they were kind to sneak something in it, but I knew there was no tooth fairy. There's a lot of people, Christians, you, you think the tooth fairy is going to come any minute. What if these projections you've been told that, that make you feel good but put you to sleep don't happen? I, I, I hope they do happen. But you, you need to be prepared. See, Christians love to be seduced by the easy way out. They want the easy road. They, they want to, that's why they, they're, they're seduced by spiritual deception all the time. It's a fundamental deceit. You want to be magically rescued by the Calvary. <clears throat> Suppose the Calvary doesn't come when you think it's going to come. You see, What's being taken out of the equation, which is the most important thing, is what you do and I do before the Lord, and what all the other people of God do before the Lord. Because let's say God wanted to do some of these things. Okay. The way God will, will do some of these things, if his people start to pray and fast, enter spiritual warfare, repent of their sins, cry out to God, and then take personal responsibility in standing up, fighting, and peacefully for righteousness, then you might see some of these things that sound too good to be true actually coming true. But if you think that God's going to send in this massive deliverance while his people are backslidden, uh, uh, rebelling from him and asleep that doesn't match the biblical model. Now, hey, I hope these good things do happen. But wisdom demands that I be prudent, that you, you are prudent. And we are faithful to what we're supposed to do in season and out of season. You understand? In the same way, I hope Jesus Christ comes back tomorrow in the rapture to take us all out of this place. I really do. I hope he comes. But I, I, I can't, I would be an unfaithful steward. I'd be a horrible father. I'd be a horrible Christian Bible teacher if I taught people to just kick back and expect Jesus to come tomorrow. Because if he doesn't come tomorrow, and they don't plan, and they're not busy with their lives, and they don't have a plan for their lives, God can't use them, and they're going to suffer needlessly. Yeah, Christ is going to come back. Absolutely. It says that in his word. But no man knows the day or the hour. So, that's why we're supposed to occupy until Christ comes. We're supposed to be faithful up until the very moment until he comes. I expect God to supernaturally deliver his people, either out of tribulation or deliver us in the middle of tribulation. Either way, God's not going to abandon us. But we have to do our part. We have to occupy the land. We have to win souls to Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. And that's exciting. And you don't have to be afraid. If you're afraid, there's one cure for being afraid. Start meditating on God, reading the Word of God, and you won't be afraid. You know why you're afraid a lot of the time? Because the media pounds fear and anxiety and depression into your head. I mean, look at it logically. Just stand back from that dumb tube. Well, it's not a tube, it's a flat screen these days. Just, st just stand back from it. How many hours have we all watched Endless bad news. You look at local television channels, all they talk about is murders, 
car crashes, accidents, shootings. I'm not saying these things aren't happening. They are. But if you do the math and the percentage rates, there's a lot of good things in America and around the world. A lot of good things. The news isn't going to tell you. So you're just saturating your mind with negativity, fear, anxiety, doom, and gloom. Well, you know what that does? Whether you realize it or not, you're actually brainwashing yourself to be depressed, filled with anxiety, have your health go bad because of the stress. Uh, You're actually brainwashing yourself to be paralyzed by fear, to be miserable. You see, because what we put into our minds and hearts, is that's what we become. That's a principle that God taught his people in Genesis, but it's also a principle that was discovered by cybernetic scientists in the 1930s at the Macy's conferences, where people like Norbert Wiener and other computer experts understood that human beings could be programmed or mind-controlled, just like computers could be programmed. Well... If that's the case, and it is the case, then let's not just keep programming ourselves with an intense negativity, despair, hopelessness of mainstream media, because it'll kill us. And the the, the thing that we have to understand is that their viewpoint is distorted. Because they don't show you the things that will set you free. They don't show you the good things that are going on. All they want to do is show car crashes, rapes, riots. Because the old expression is bad news sells. God wants you to be filled with joy. You know, the Lord spoke to me. And when I say the Lord spoke to me, I don't mean in an audible voice. I talk to the Lord a lot. Am I super spiritual, super holy? No, I'm just like you. Just like you. But I talk to the Lord all the while, a lot. And he speaks to me in a still, small voice or in my inner imagination. And I was asking the Lord about something. Just slow my mind. I'm trying to regain it. I was asking the Lord about, um, oh yeah, what's going to happen to America in the future? How, how can we make an effective change and stuff? And then I asked him about joy. This was a number of years ago, not not that long ago. I never could really, you know, I obviously knew that joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. But I never really, the word joy was like a turnoff to me. It sounded like a Christmas carol word from, you know, the, the, the Christmas carol play and musical. And I just couldn't relate to the word joy, you know, happy. But something about the word joy, I just couldn't connect to. Because I guess because I didn't really experience joy, per se. I've experienced being happy a lot, but joy was like weird. It was like a shoe that didn't fit. So I asked the Lord about that. I said, Lord, why do I have a problem with the word joy? Why do I why do I not seem to understand what joy is? It's got to be good, or you wouldn't be listening, uh, listing it as a fruit of the spirit. He said, "Paul." He said, "Paul, it's because you don't know what real joy is. You're equating joy with all those dumb Christmas cards they had, and stuff you see in shopping malls, and all the commercialization. And so, and I'm not knocking people sending Christmas cards that say joy. I'm not knocking you for doing that. But the Lord said to me." Your experience regarding the word joy is always connected to the commercialization of Christmas and stuff, and so it's a hollow word to you. And then the Lord said to me, in a still small voice, he said, I want you to open your mind up and your heart up, and I want you to allow me to teach you about joy. And then he said, I want to teach you about joy, Paul, in the most radical. I want to teach you about joy in the most counterintuitive sense. And then he said, Paul, I want to teach you about joy in a way that you never considered. I want to teach you about joy that in a way that is totally opposite of everything you think you know or don't know about joy. I want to teach you about joy in the sense of it being outrageously the opposite of what most people have told you. And I really didn't know what the Lord was talking about. (laughs) But then he showed me. He showed me, the Lord showed me about joy. 
actually, he revealed it to me supernaturally in Jerusalem when I was walking as fast as I could to pray at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem during the Feast of Booths. And uh, what happened was uh, I, supernatural joy came up upon me. But, but what happened was is that I realized that joy, the joy of the Lord comes upon you and joy is supernatural. If you're trying to work up joy or uh, make it up, it doesn't work. And that's what you're acting to, Paul. Joy is something supernatural I give my people, and there doesn't have to be. This is the key thing that the Lord was trying to get through to me. He said, in order to have my supernatural joy, there doesn't have to be any logical reason or circumstances for you to be joyous. In other words, most people think that they can have joy when things are going their way, when they can pay their bills, when they're healthy, you know, when they got a promotion or whatever, then they're joyous. But the Lord said to me, Paul, I'm going to show you what supernatural joy means when all hell's breaking loose, when everything's going and everything's going not your way. And then I stepped into a place in my mind and consciousness by the Lord, where I began to experience joy on a supernatural level and in complete defiance, if you will, of the circumstances. And joy wasn't this lame thing that I thought. I thought joy would be like a lame thing. I don't know if you know what I mean. Joy was like, wow, this is intense. I love this. I love this. This is like supernatural. I didn't even know what it... The word joy, the way we translate the word joy, it it, it doesn't work today anymore because nobody knows what you're talking about. I didn't. The joy of the Lord began to come upon me and it's like a supernatural transcendence, but it's real at the same time. And then the Lord showed me that the joy of the Lord is my strength and that, Paul, if you want to be strong day in and day out. If you want to be strong in spiritual battles, strong in ministry, strong in your life, he said to me, I want to tell you a secret, Paul. The Lord said to me, learn to, oh, he said, he can't, you can't produce joy, so don't try to fail, he said to me. He said, just open your heart up by faith, says the Lord, and I'll fill you with joy. And you will discover that when you're filled with my joy, you will have supernatural strength and power that will enable you to carry uh, carry on and over and be victorious in a way that you've never understood before. Wow, that's mind-blowing. So I want to share that with you right now before we close this edition of the Paul McGuire Report. And I want to ask you to pray a prayer if you'd like to be filled with this supernatural joy. Because... There's no way to get this joy by trying to crank it up. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you, God, that your word says, whatever we ask you in Jesus' name, that you will do for us. So, Lord, I think there's probably many people out there who don't know much more about joy than I did and who desperately need joy because their hearts are heavy, their hearts are aching, loneliness, all kinds of problems, and there's no joy in their hearts, and they're trying to be joyful, but it's like being in a, in a, uh, whatever you call those things, when you used to kind of like sink in a sand. Lord, we admit to you that we can't produce joy by ourselves. So Lord, we ask you by faith right now, Lord, we ask you by faith to fill us supernaturally with your joy. We ask you right now in the name of Jesus to allow each of us to have an ongoing supernatural encounter with your joy in the midst of the madness, Lord. And Lord, we pray for all the other people that are listening, Father, right now in the name of Jesus. You that are listening to me, Paul McGuire, in Ireland, in Scotland, Sweden, the Ukraine, Russia, For some reason, the Lord's putting on my heart a lot of uh, nations in a particular region. 
those of you in Eastern Europe, the European Union, and then the Lord is putting in my heart that there's many people listening in the Asian nations, both China, Japan, and other nations, some of the islands, the big islands, nations, Australia, New Zealand, all across the United States, in, in many states, and in South America, people everywhere. And Lord, their situations are causing them to experience bleaklessness and depression and hopelessness. Lord, we pray for all these people and we ask that they would join in in prayer with us. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, right now, Father, miraculously, with the same power that you raised Jesus Christ from the dead, Lord, we ask together right now that you would fill every single person in every single nation who is asking you to do this for them right now. Lord, let them instantaneously walk right in to supernatural joy. And the, the, the picture the Lord is showing me, it's like you're, you're, you're like in one environment and you're simply just walking and all of a sudden you walk into an atmosphere filling your heart, mind, and soul and everything around you. You supernaturally walk into an atmosphere filled with supernatural joy and the Lord releases supernatural joy um, in your heart, mind, and soul. And you're lit up with a supernatural encounter. You can walk right into it. It's like it's a place. You walked into supernatural joy. And now the Lord is speaking to me to, to, to share something with you. He's saying, don't, um, he's saying, continue to walk in my supernatural joy. It'll be counterintuitive. Don't, don't only welcome my joy when things are going well. The Lord says, I want you to, 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 to do something that seems the opposite of everything you've been told. I want you, when things are difficult, to walk into my joy. And if you choose to walk into my joy, my joy will take over you. And the joy of the Lord is your strength, says the Lord. The Lord is also saying, tell my people, I am sending my joy upon you right now as a gift. The Lord says, I know your situation. I know your trials. I know your adversity. I know your heartache. And the Lord is saying, continue to pray and seek my face, says the Lord, because I'm faithful. But in the meantime, says the Lord, walk into my joy. Allow my joy to transform you. Allow, don't have a preconceived idea about it. Let joy have its complete work in you. And you will light up. And, says the Lord, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Lord says, I have marked this day on my calendar, says the Lord. And the Lord says, I want you to mark this day and this time on your calendar, says the Lord that you are listening to this radio program, the Paul McGuire Report. And mark this day and this time down, says the Lord, because this is the day where you walked in to my natural joy. And the Lord says, I want you to learn how to walk continually in my supernatural joy, and I want you to be a transmitter of my supernatural joy to share it with others. And the Lord says, you will discover, oh, this is powerful, man. The Lord is saying, you will discover the healing power, the rejuvenating power, the strengthening power, the complete transformational power of my supernatural joy will bring you delights ecstasy, peace, and you will literally taste of the goodness of the kingdom of God in heaven by asking me by faith to, to fill you with supernatural joy. Lord, we thank you right now for letting 
endless numbers of people walk right into your joy and that they're transformed even now, God, and the weight and oppression is banished in the name of Jesus. It's done. Oppression, depression, weight, fear, anxiety, trepidation, nervousness, heart palpitations, it's gone now in the name of Jesus. It's vaporized and joy has shown up. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Now, I believe that was real. I believe that was God moving among his people. I didn't expect it. And I want to encourage you. There are people who need to hear a message like this. So send them a link of this message. And you might write a little personal note from you saying that the beginning of the message, we, he talks about uh, uh, spiritual discernment, false prophets, etc. But in the uh, half of the message, he talks about the supernatural power of joy. So that's it, man. Let's, let's keep marching on. Let's keep going forward. It really won't be all that long till we will be in the kingdom of heaven. I'm not saying something horrible is going to happen to us. That's not what I'm saying. It's just that times, time flies by. So, you know, we're here on earth. Let's be faithful. Let's occupy until he comes. Let's win souls for Jesus. But it won't be long, my dear friends. It won't be long. It'll be, be a lot quicker than you think. And all of us have to be absent from the body and present with the Lord, with the new glorified body, living in the new heaven, new Jerusalem, and new earth. Wow. And joy. The joy you walk in begins now. I hope that helped you. I really do. It helped me. I can tell you that. It helped me. I felt the joy of God just... Well, it was like I'm sitting here in the studio, and it was like it was like joy was right next to me, right in front of me, all of me, but somehow it wasn't in me. And then when I began to share with you about joy and walking into joy, it's like all of a sudden <laughs> I walked into joy. Now that's a supernatural experience, but that's that's gas for the gas tank, fuel for the rocket. And that's what we live on. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. Make sure to, to get as a gift and send it to people. The download of the uh, video document, American Mind Wars, the coming crisis event. And spread this message of joy any way you can. God bless you, your brother in Christ, Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. And, and be joyful, man. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Rejoice.